So welcome back to the second hour or second couple of hours, I should say, of this really fast introduction. My name is Tom King. I'll be going ahead and giving you your second uh, half here. A little about my background. I've been working in an embedded space for forever, probably 45 years or so. Um, and I started working with embedded Linux in 2004 and realized that quite very quickly that with multiple architectures at the same time, Super H and probably things that have come and gone and died and other things such as that, um, Strongarm, others, that it was quickly a problem of moving from one architecture to another, depending on what you have, you'd have to basically start over again. So in 2005, I discovered Open Embedded um, and of course BitBake, which uh, really uh, revolutionized things for me and made things uh, quite a bit better. So I've been playing with it since about then. Um, I'm a consulting engineer and I work in the broadcast space. So, you know, multiplexers and switchers and routers and things like that for uh, audio and video. So that's kind of the area I work in there. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and start. So up to this point, we've been talking about the metadata and we've been talking about the about various types of recipes and how they're how they're put together, how you what are the things that are required for it. We touched a little bit on package groups. If you think about package groups, they're a group of of um, they're, they're a group of recipes and pins which allow you to build a certain group of, of packages all together at one time. So now we're gonna start talking about how we build a full embedded image with Yocto. And basically we're gonna expand on that. That is to say, we're gonna go ahead and build package groups together. And those package groups together uh, will form a full image that is bootable on your system. We'll also include, generally speaking, the bootloader as part of the image and also the kernel. So those things will be added as part of it. And together you'll end up with an image that probably is made up of, it could be ext4, it could be a Squashafest system, and that'll all be something that you could take, put onto um, some form of flash device and boot, the, boot your uh, embedded device with. All right, so let's see, yep. Here's, a, here's kind of how you do the whole thing. Download the Octo Project sources. You get them from the octoproject.org. We're talking about version 3.13. Get the version that makes the most sense for you. In this case, we're showing Dunfell here. Untar it. Clone. Uh, you can also clone it if you'd rather do that. And again, you could get the version that's the latest version, or if you have to get a version that's previous to that, you can do that as well. You build one of the reference. Linux distributions. Basically, you're going to source the, the OE init build environment script. Going to create your own directory for what you're going to build. Then you're going to go ahead and choose what machine you want to deal with. QMU x86 or QMU ARM. That's one of the normal ones. Just check it and make sure you have sanity. Go ahead and bit back minus K so that it can continue. Core image minimal. That's kind of a an image that'll boot has a little bit of console, has a few other things as well for you. And if that goes ahead and works, go ahead and run the run QEMU, boot it into the into QEMU, and you'll get a you'll get a command prompt at that point, or probably a login prompt is what you'll get. And then profit well, there's a whole lot more to do. That's a basically the way it works in a nutshell. However, there's a whole bunch more details that we'll go over here now. Okay. So let's talk about the host system layout. So when you download Pocky, it creates this Yocto directory. You'll end up with a build directory or whatever the name of the one that you're gonna choose is. That's where you actually will be doing your building. A downloads directory that's generally above and outside of your build directory so that you can share it amongst multiple builds. Remember, we talked about the fact that you can build from multiple architectures by keeping things out of the build directory. You can say, oh, I don't really like the line that I'm going with. Wipe out the build directory, keep the downloads directory, keep the, keep the Pocky directory in the shared state cache and go ahead and start over again. Makes it really simple. There's your Pocky directory. 
One thing to note, and I don't know if it's been said, do not modify anything in here. And the reason for that is when you do a Git update to get you to the next version of Pocky, anything you've done in the Pocky directory gets wiped out. So you don't want to do that. So the first thing you might want to do is create your own distribution, change the Pocky name to something else, go make a copy of it, whatever you want to do as far as that goes, get it out of the way, create by distribution, whatever the name of it's going to be instead of Pocky. And you end up with all these directories there. So you'll end up with the, the things that you need in order to be able to build an entire image. All right. We'll cover a little bit about how to use these layers to make the, the changes later on. So the fact that there's a, a Pocky layer here in that Pocky directory, we don't want to mess with. We'll talk about that later. All right. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about the concept of layers later on, but just not, just know that we have a metadata layer called which we call meta itself, which is OE core. That's the things that every pretty much every build is going to need. You're going to need libraries. You're going to need utilities. You're going to need all those things. You'll find a lot of those in OE core. Meta Pocky is your distribution layer. That'll be the layer that is going to be changed to whatever your name is. Meta Foo because you have Foo OS. So you will call yours Metafoo. On top of that, we have the, the BSP layer. This is the layer that talks about the actual hardware that you have, has the information about what architecture you're building for, what options you're going to be, you know, you need the compiler to know about all those things, including some information about how to build a kernel is going to be in the Yocto BSP layer. If you have an IMX6, it'll be probably come from Meta, whatever they're, they've changed their name to recently. And that's where it'll come from. If you get it from Xilinx, it'll come from Meta Xilinx BSP. So you'll have it from there. Inside of this Pocky directory, we're going to have a license. Just everything, as you know, has licenses. There'll be a README and a little bit more README about the hardware. There'll be BitBake. That's the actual BitBake tool that you've downloaded. Every version of Pocky brings its own version of BitBake. They kind of have worked together. They've been tested together. Could you sit there and use different versions of BitBake with different versions of Pocky? Yes. Will things break? Probably. Be aware that you might want to keep those two together. Documentation layer, there's a lot of information, including the some of the Octo, uh, a lot of the Octo pieces. There should be a copy of the BitBake manual in there as well as the Octo manual. Then they'll have start having the metadata layers here. The meta, meta here, that's your OE core layer. Meta Pocky, that's your distribution layer. Meta Yocto BSP, that is your BSP layer. This OE init build environment script is how everything gets set up and how you create your first build. It sets up all the environment variables. It allows BitBake to start looking for where it's supposed to find all of its configuration bits. And then there's some additional scripts and, and utilities, which are located in the scripts directory, such as the run QEMU script, all of those would be located within that. All right. So let's set up a build directory here. Let's start by setting up the build directory. We have a local configuration. We've talked about local.conf. That's where that local, that information goes for that particular build. Included in that, of course, is what architecture you're going to build for, any options about how you're going to build it, whether you're going to use minus J4, how many threads you're going to have, things like that. Some temporary build artifacts will be in there. I'm probably sure that Vian has talked about the fact that it might is not unusual to have 100 gigabytes of space taken up for a typical build, especially when you're building an entire image. So... Originally, you would start with your home Yocto or wherever you downloaded it to. You'll go ahead and source this OE init build environment script. This build here will be whatever the name of your build is going to be. If you're building Foo OS, you might say Foo ARM. So you're saying, I'm going to start doing a, an ARM build using my Foo OS here. That'll become a directory name, which you'll use. With, and you're going to replace it, whatever directory name you want to use for your project. You'll need to rerun this script on any new terminal you start. Because again, remember I said it sets up 
the environment variables and the paths. Those are the important things because the number one thing I've discovered is, is that people forget to do that. And they all of a sudden say, hey, why is this thing building x86? Or hey, why aren't we able to find all these paths? It's because you haven't sourced this for your new terminal session, okay? You have to make sure of the project directory name has to match, otherwise it'll build and make a new one for you. But if you have it already, it'll just simply set up the environment variables, set up the paths correctly, and dump you in that directory, okay? All right, is everybody hearing me okay? Or am I talking to myself? No, sound is good, all fine. Thank you, thank you, okay. So within the build directory itself, you'll find that in the Octo build, okay, we're just using one that's called build. We'll have a lock file. We'll have some cache information. This is BitBake's parsed information about what it's going to build, how it's going to build it, and when it's going to build it. You have some a comp layer, which is a comp directory, which is required for each one. You'll notice that we have a bblayers.comp. We'll talk about that in just a bit when we get into the layers section. This is all the layers that the configuration knows about that it's going to go and look in to find all the recipes and BB appends files that it needs in order and comp files for that matter, that it, that it needs to find all of the uh, things that it will use for parsing, BitBake will use for parsing to do the builds. You have a local.conf, which is generally where you'll set the machine that you're going to build and, and what you're going to build. You'll, we'll see that and we'll be getting into that in just a bit if you haven't done that already. And then we have a site.conf. This, will, if you're working in a work group, for example, site.conf will set up certain things like, hey, we have a downloads directory that is on an NFS server and you're just going to link to that one because everybody uses that. Instead of downloading 50 copies for 50 people of all the different sources, we've got one already because we've set up a source server for ourselves. So things like that will be located in site.conf. Then we have the temp directory. Remember he was talking about TMP versus TEMP, which is the actual, what was actually built. You'll find in TEMP, the temp directory, that's where the actual build will take place. Everything above that is all either configuration data or metadata that's being, that's being kept track of. So you're gonna actually build in temp here, okay. So the general procedure is create a project directory using the, by sourcing the OENIT build environment script, configure the build by editing local.conf. In, in local.conf, you're gonna set the appropriate machine type. You're gonna figure out where the shared downloads directory is. These are kind of minimal things here and set where the shared, set where the shared state directory is gonna live. Now, as I said earlier, the best place that you wanna do that is you wanna keep those above your build directory. You don't want to put them in the middle of your build directory. That way, if you want to say, you know, this thing is not working quite right, blow away the build directory, start over again, good to go, and you haven't lost any of the downloads of the shared state cache. Okay. All right. Build your selected image. In this case, we're going to use core image minimal. It is one of the recipe, the image recipes that comes from meta or open embedded core. And then we'll talk a little bit about the detailed steps. Okay, all right. So we configure the build by editing local.conf. There's a bunch of places you can edit it, but the most, the most logical place normally is to edit local.conf in your build directory. And you'll wanna set those at machines, the download directory and the state directory. There's some additional things, for example, such as how many BB threads, because I've got 32 cores in my machines, or I've got, um, I wanna do minus J4, because I can, I can certainly do that, or J15 or whatever you want to increase the parallelization. There's some other options in there as well. But typically the ones that you'll set is, what is the name of the machine you're actually gonna build for? It may be your board. It, in this case, we're going to use QEMU ARM as our target. We have a download directory. You'll notice that Topter, um, remember from, from previously, Topter, and then dot, dot, downloads. Topter is what? It's that build directory, right? So we want to go above that. 
Same thing with our shared stake cache. And you'll notice that it's by machine. The shared stake cache is by machine. So if you're building for ARM and then you change the machine to QMUX86, you'll end up with a second shared state cache that'll be for QEMUX86 because of course we don't want to try and use the ARM binaries and and link those into our x86 binaries. All right. Notice how you can use the variables. You can use variables in setting these. You'll notice that we're using top dir here. We're going ahead up, up one directory level. Same thing with top dir here. So you'll see that that's one of the reasons why we have previously used that environment variable setup. All right. Let's see. This builds an entire embedded Linux distribution. When we say that, it usually includes not only the root FS, but it also typically includes, well, quorum is minimal does not. Uh, that's not true. It does build the kernel. That's right. Builds the kernel for it. So, and it's, and that would be used for QMU. Uh, in this case, QMU ARM is what we set it up for to actually boot. On the fast computer, the first build may take better part of an hour on a slow machine. Well, it could be very minimal. One thing to note is the first time you do a build, especially of an image, the first thing it does for the, and it has like 3,000 to 4,000 tasks, you sit there and go, oh, it's not going to take very long. It's going to take maybe less than 30 minutes. You go along, it's building, it's building, it's building. It gets down five, four, three, two, one tasks, 29,475 tasks. You go, whoa, wait a minute now. What just happened? I thought I was done with this. What you did was you set up the tool chain, you set up all the libraries that it's going to link to, all the native tools, all those things were done for you one time every time you build an, a new uh, architecture. After that, it starts actually building the image for you, whatever it is you asked it to build. So, so you, now, however, the next time you build it, Let's say you add, you decide, hey, I want to add drop bear to my image. So you plus, you know, include it. You go ahead and say, all right, that's what I want. It'll it'll sit there and because it has shared state cache, it will look at it and say, I built all these things. I built the I built the tool chains. I built all the libraries you're going to link, the native things. And you're only asking me to build this one recipe. And everything else has been built already because we did a core image minimal. Only, the, only those dependencies and our depends will be built along with whatever it is you asked to be built. OK, so it can take as little as five minutes, of which two or three minutes of that is actually doing the parse, figuring out what's going on. OK, I only need to build this one thing and it can do that for you. Now, if you change architectures, it, it has to start over again, right? Because it has to build all of the tool chain and all of the natives and everything else that it needs for that particular tool chain, plus whatever libraries you're gonna do. All right. We use the run QEMU script that comes from the scripts directory here to boot that image. It auto detects some settings as much as possible. There are some things that you can do here. In this case, we're going to say it's no graphic. That means we're not going to work, think that we're going to bring up an X11 screen. We're just going to go ahead and bring up a console. QMU arm, it knows what it actually is. The image is, it looks at the image, says, this is an arm image. We're going to go ahead and run QMU using the arm interpreter for it. You'll notice that this square brackets here, you don't type the square brackets. That just means it's optional. That's all we're trying to do here. And of course, if you're running QEMUX86, you'd change this to QEMUX86. That's the actual image. It's the value of machine, if you will. Our QEMU instance should boot, and you quit by closing the QEMU window, if you will. You can kill it also from a. You can also kill it from a another terminal if you need to. So that's a pretty typical way that it's used. This is great for verifying that you have the image, verifying that the thing that you put in the image actually showed up in the image. So you can go ahead and say, yep, that uh, drop bear that I just 
created um, actually showed up in the image now. No problem. That's that's kind of what you're trying to do here with this. All right. And I don't see any questions. That's good. Hopefully that means I'm explaining it well enough and not that everybody's lost. Okay. All right. So originally, what we're going to talk a little bit about, about layers. Um, originally, when I started working with Open Embedded, Open Embedded had all of the recipes in one directory. The result of having it in all in one directory meant that it was easy to find everything because it was all in one place, but it was a total mess. It was also a total mess to try and keep track of versions of images. In OE Classic, for example, everything was in one place and it was very difficult to keep track of where you, you know, what versions you had. You had to do a lot of searches, figure it all out. Um, and it wasn't very flexible. It really was one thing. And once you diverted from the main OE, it became yours. You had to literally own everything that was in there if you started making changes, because there was no good way to do it in an upgrade. But the concept of layers were brought in when, um, when Yocto Project came along in 2010. So there was a five-year period where we were doing everything in what we call OE Classic, all in one directory. They brought in the concept of layers and basically it allows you to override various values without editing the originally provided files. That means that I only have to maintain the BB appends files that matter for me to, to alter the recipes, but the base recipes are being handled by the Yocto project or some other group for me. So for example, if I'm modifying something in Meta Xilinx and I have a BB append for that, I'm only responsible for maintaining that BB append. Meta Xilinx is responsible for taking the taking care of the underlying recipe. So the concept of a, of a layer was introduced such that you could layer, such you could add or subtract layers as you needed them in order to make it so that you get the full image of what you, you need. So for example, well, let's go back here to this picture right now, just for a second. It's right here. This is kind of minimal. Now, we use OE core, pretty much everybody uses recipes from OE core. There's a lot of things in there that you expect to find. There's file utilities, there's bin utilities, there's the C library itself. There's a whole bunch of things that are gonna be in this layer here that just every system needs. You're gonna have, you possibly can have a Metapocky layer. This is the distribution layer and you provide policy as to what things you want in your sync. I'm going to build for X. So I'm going to put a policy that says build everything for X in here, or I'm not going to ever have X windows. And I'm going to make sure that everything in this particular case doesn't build for X because I'm never going to use X. And the next layer up, this Meta BFP, Meta Yocto BSP layer, that's your hardware layer. That's going to say I'm running an ARM A9 and I'm going to have these options are available when you want to do the build. We're going to tell the compiler and the tool chain, these are the things that we're going to use when we're going to do it. We're going to have an optimization of two. We're going to run O2 on this particular one, or I want to run O3 on this. All of that information would come out of Meta Yocto BSP. Okay, does that make sense? Anyone? Thumbs up? Okay, thank you. All right, a layer is used. To, so we have a layer that's used in this case to represent OE core, a board support package layer, BSP layer. That's gonna be specific to whatever hardware you have. Oftentimes that'll come from the, the hardware vendor themselves. If, if you bought a board or if you bought a architecture, it's gonna come from Meta Xilinx, Meta whoever. Is, is providing the BSP layer for that. An application stack layer, and then your new code, whatever you have, that'll be included in your own layer. Now, remember we talked about the fact that your distribution layer shouldn't be Pocky, shouldn't be Meta Pocky, should be Meta whatever your particular distribution name is going to be. We do have the concept of priorities and override policy based on the priority of the particular layer. We'll see that a little bit when we get into the layer, uh, get into the um, configurations. 
layer.conf and bblayer.conf. And then all these metadata and, and, and configuration settings can be overridden from things that have a lesser priority. And we'll see that here in just a minute here. All right. So here's kind of the way that you would, might expect to see things. The minimum you'll probably need to have is a meta layer here, OE core, a meta pocky. This will be meta whatever your distribution is. Change it, change out the name. Go ahead and um, make your, your policy there. And that, that policy here will modify what these recipes do down here. They may contain their own additional recipes. Sometimes a layer may contain only just a configuration files that are necessary and a BB append. So your developer layer, for example, could have just that. The BSP layer, of course, which is your hardware, defining the hardware that you're going to actually be building for. Any UI or GUI layer, that's your X, that's your Boylan Weston, things like that will all exist in that GUI and UI layer. Of course, it doesn't have to be. If you don't, if you're running headless, you don't need that, right? Any commercial OSV layer, if you're going to buy something like Wind River Linux or something like that, it would go with this layer. And of course, this will modify all the layers that are below it, right? So you'll notice that it goes way up at the top. There's going to be a bunch of things that'll change this. This OSB here is up. This um, OS vendor information will override whatever your oftentimes override whatever your policy is for MetaFoo, your Foo OS, if you will. A very good example of this is Petalinux, for example, that's done by Xilinx. It's a very good example of that. And then on top of that would be your developer layers. We have the concept of doing SDKs and we can allow our developers to use these SDKs in order to be able to do that. Your developer layers will live at the very top top level. They'll also sit there and say, oh, I need a particular recipe that's from meta, from, from meta down here, maybe clear from meta down here. I have a particular recipe that I need to use. It's down here. I'm going to modify it slightly in order to make it work for me, but I need that. And normally it's not going to be built in unless your developer needs it. Okay, no problem. You, it'll go ahead and build that recipe for you as part of your image. All right, so this is kind of the, and by the way, developer layer, you'll notice that the word S is here, that little S is there because you can have more than one layer. You can have 10 or 15 layers. I've never seen more than about eight. Doesn't mean you can't, but if, for example, if you're, you've got developers that are developing the UI, developers that are developing the app, developers that are developing other pieces of it, then you could have multiple developers layers here and you can give them all their own layer. Okay. All right. Layers are added to your by inserting them added to your build by inserting them into the BB layers. BB layers sits at the top level of conf directory. This is the one that BitBake will use to figure out what other layers to go rifling through to find out where the configuration files are to go look at the uh, both the appends, BB appends and BB um, and BB uh, files. So we're going to start with Meta. Here's our lowest layer, if you will. That's the base layer we're going to build on. Then we have Meta Pocky. Again, you'd replace this with Meta Foo or whatever the name of your particular. Uh, distribution is, you may get it from your vendor. Meta Yocto BSP, again, this will come from the hardware vendor, typically, unless you're rolling your own. Um, you can roll your own, but normally you would use the Meta Yocto, whatever, Meta um, BSP layer from whoever you provide your silicon. And in doing so, modify it with your additional layers on top of that. You might modify it with your developer layer that says, hey, we're going to do this but we're going to use this particular option. So for example, you could see don't build it with X or go ahead and build it with a, a particular um, option turned on uh, as far as optimizations, for example, as far as that goes. So let's talk a little bit more about board support packages. BSPs are layers that enable support for specific hardware platforms. Like I said, they typically come from your vendor. They don't have to, you can roll your own, but most people don't. 
they use it at least as a starting place. It defines some machine configuration variables for the board. Oftentimes it tells the compiler and the linker and the entire tool chain, these are the options that you should, you should normally use for this particular hardware, whether it be optimization, optimizations, whether it be linker, um, some linker pieces, you know, options for linker. It has specific recipes for your bootloader. And yes, this can be, this can be grub, this could be, um, this could be uh, U-boot, could be others as well. It has the kernel configuration. This is where the base con kernel configuration is going to be. If you've got certain things that you need to turn on to it, you might have to modify the kernel recipe. There's a number of ways to modify kernel recipes. But it starts with this base kernel config, which will generally get a system up. And generally speaking, it'll run the QAMU for that. <clears throat> it'll have the information related to any graphics drivers such as XORD or Wayland Weston. Those things would be in this layer as well. And then any additional recipes to support hardware features. If you've got a MIPS processor that has an offload engine in it, for example, that allows you to do networking stuff with it, those hardware features. Uh, for that will show up in this layer and they'll come from whatever the, the maybe it'll be part of the Octeon or whatever the particular uh, hardware you have, you'll have to get the correct BSP that supports that particular piece of hardware. So those offload engines can be, those the customizations that need to be done for that offload engine can be built for, as an example. All right. When doing development with Pocky, we say don't modify the Pocky source tree. We really mean that. Don't modify the Pocky source tree. Put everything in your own build, in your own layers. Because what's going to happen is, is that when you do an update, it'll all go away. You don't want that to all go away. Remember your configuration, you can have a site.conf that you can pass from, that you can pass from uh, group to group. Your local.conf will probably be not messed with, especially if it's in your own layer. It'll only be if it's in the Pocky directory and any of those other directories that we showed earlier once you run the OE and Nets build environment script. Now, it won't sit there and get rid of your, when you do the update, you won't lose your shared state caches and you won't generally lose your um, downloads as well. So you don't generally need to worry about those. But generally speaking, don't modify anything that's in Metapocky, for example. Not a good idea. All right. Remember I said that originally we had in OE Classic, everything was in one directory. It was a real nightmare to update. Not really a nightmare to update with Yocto and Pocky. You still have to make the things that you need to work with the new libraries and the new utilities and stuff like that. As you know, sometimes libraries deprecate things and and certain um, pieces are missing that you might have to add back in and get, hey, we're not going to do that. The other thing that happens within this that I want to talk about in layers is things get moved around in layers. So when you think that it's in, you know, you want to include it from a particular layer, you may find that, for example, something that was in meta has been moved into meta networking or something that was in meta networking has now been moved into meta. They, that happens between versions. Normally, BitBake is smart enough to be able to look at all the different recipes. And as long as the name hasn't changed in a slightly weird way that makes it hard, it'll find it in the new location for you. So typically, that works pretty well. But in general, we say don't modify anything in the BitBake directory. Don't modify anything in Metapocky and also in, Met, in OE Core. Append, append, append. Use append because that is that allows you to go from one to another without having to have your own recipe and maintain your own recipe. So you never want to see, for example, I wouldn't want to see a version of, well, okay, let me back up here in a minute. I would not want to see the same version of a particular recipe in, that's in meta that's in that's in OE core show up in my uh, directory show up in, in in my layer at all 
if it's a different version that's not supported by the current version of whatever you're doing, I need a, I need an updated version of a library. I need an updated version of of something else that's a different different version of it. Then you might have your own BB file. However, if it's if you're going to use the same one, if you, you're going to use the one that's provided by another layer, add an append that does the options that you need to have. Does that make sense? Can anybody give me a thumbs up on that? Okay, thank you. All right. It does make it easier to port. I'm gonna, not easily, I'm gonna say easier because remember you're gonna to have to deal with the fact that there's updated libraries and maybe what you're doing and what you're using in your app does not work correctly with those libraries. So you might still have to go and fix your application to use the updated libraries, for example. But it does make it a lot easier because everything that's yours is contained in your own layers. Layers can be created manually. You have to go and change a couple of files. You've got to add the BB layer stuff. Comp, you've got to add your layer to that. You've got to point to the right place. You've got to create your own layer, add the comp. Uh, subdirectory, set up your local.com, set up all the other pieces. There is, however, a tool called Yocto Layer Tool, which makes it a lot easier where it'll do a lot of those things for you. So Meta Yocto Layer, create YPDD. This is our, for today, the YP Developer Day. It'll create a Meta YPDD in the current directory. So you have to make sure you're at the right level. You can go ahead and use and it'll also sit there and configure the uh, bblayers.conf. It'll add your layer to bblayers.conf in the appropriate place or what is what it thinks is the appropriate place, which is down at the bottom. So there's a whole bunch of nice things that happen for you if you use this tool here. Now, board support packages, you can create your, your own board support package here. You'll notice that you also have to include the architecture you're supporting for this particular BSP. That gives it a starting place to know, kind of populate certain things. Now ARM itself in this case is the 32-bit ARM version. So it's gonna make some assumptions here. It's not gonna know that it's an A9 or an A8 or something else. It's just gonna know that certain things need to be uh, set up for ARM, 32-bit ARM. So a lot of things will be pre-done for you. Makes your life a lot easier. Then you only have to say, oh, you need to add the additional pieces because I'm an A9, I'm an A8, I'm a Cortex-M, M0, whatever your, your particular device is. Now, ARM in this particular case, it would be ARM Cortex if you were going to use the Cortex version. It's a little bit different. So it's going to create a meta BSP for in the current directory. So that's the difference. The only thing is you'll notice it'll instead of saying meta YPDD, it'll be a BSP layer and it'll include some information that gets filled in for you. Not completely because you're still going to have to tell it a lot of, of the options that you want for that particular architecture. Okay. All right. So we're going to create our own custom layer. We're going to change directory into Yocto. That's our top dir, if you will. We're going to source this in its script here to a new build. That build directory actually becomes top dir at that point. We're going to use bitbake layers, create YPDD. We've gone ahead and created a layer within that. Gets added to the layer index. It gets added to, to um, uh, it gets added to uh, bblayers.conf confbblayers.com from the top level. And then you'll notice that it's going to ask you some questions here. The first thing it's going to ask you is what the default is for the layer. Six is a very high priority. This is because my layer is going to override the layers below it. That's important for us. You set this at one, it's not going to do a whole lot. You set it at six, it's going to do a whole lot of, of modification. Because remember, you with layers, you're actually looking down through all of the different layers 
that are below it from starting with the base layer of meta and then the distribution layer on top of that and the PSP layer. And then now in this particular case, your layer, you know, YPDD may be that fourth layer on the, on the cake here. And now you're looking down through all of them. So this one here would modify things that are lower than that below it if you had something like a BB append or a configuration change, for example. You can create example recipes by default. It, it doesn't know why example. This will show you that you, what, what a BB file would look like basically as a skeleton and a BB append, same thing. It'll also have some configuration files perhaps as well. Um, for that, it'll have at least a local.conf, which has the, the, the skeleton from it. It'll talk about the different supported layer things such as uh, the six different architectures that are supported. And then it creates a, a, an example directory and then example.bb inside there as well. So remember that each layer has to have its own layer slash conf directory. So each, each, each one has to, and then there'll be a layer.conf. I don't see, I don't think we've seen that yet. We'll see that in a minute, but that's required in each layer. So layer name, conf directory with a local, with a conf in it as well, with a layer.conf, I should say. You like to have an example of a BB append. Again, you can see both of those can be created. Now your new layer has been created. Don't forget it to add it to your BB layers. This should have actually done that for you as creating it. So let's take a look at what our tree is going to look like here. We're going to have a copying. Generally speaking, they use the MIT license for metadata. You don't have to. You could use whatever is appropriate for your particular organization. You're going to have a readme, but you'll see that that's just a directory. You're going to have a conf layer.conf that is required in every layer. In this case, you'll see we have a recipes example. We have an example subdirectory in that. And then we have example 0.1. Again, if you don't actually create an actual name, it'll assume it's 0.1. And then you'll see that they've got an example of a patch. And then there's a hello world.c in there. They have a BB file. This is the actual recipe itself, the BB file. Okay, so in our layer.conf, we are going to have the important things, the BB path, we're going to go ahead and append the, our, this particular layer DIRS directory. We're going, to we're going to create a set of patterns that BitBake is going to use when it um, goes to parse the, the, um, the recipes and the appends. This is the pattern that you're going to follow when it does the search pattern. We're going to call it the, this one YPDD. This is the, the name of it, if you will. You'll notice that's going to look in the layer directory. It's going to look at that BB path. And then the important thing is it's got a priority that's high enough to affect lower layers. It doesn't have to be six, could be five, could be four, if that's sufficient enough. And you'll, this is one of those things that you can tweak to get it to um, have the right amount of influence over the other layers. All right, so if you add layers to your build, you'll notice in this particular case, there's our meta YPDD. It's gonna be dropped into the bottom here. Lowest layer, first layer that it's gonna parse, second layer, third layer, and then this fourth layer. So that's the fourth layer on the top of the cake there, if you will. So, we do have this BitBank layers help. You can go ahead and create all the layers. You can add layers, remove layers. Flatten is an interesting thing in that it creates all that layers configuration bits and flattens it out. So it looks at what would happen if I took the BB append that's in this particular layer that modifies the lowest layer that's of this recipe that's down at, in OE core or meta. You can see what the effect of what that actual recipe would look like because you've added options or you've deleted options. You can see all of that by using flatten. You can show the currently configured layers here. 
the showing overlaid, you can show recipes that have BB pins that are associated with them. I'm sorry, in this particular case, it would be um, layer BB uh, files, uh, BB files that have been replaced by a different layer. Sorry about that for overlaid. Showing the appends, on the other hand, shows you any base recipe plus the append that goes over the top of it and what's been appended. You can show some dependencies. This can show how layer dependencies are um, by using cross depends to see what's going on. Because, it, because one thing that's important to note is what layer is being, uh, do I need to have in there? And I might be missing a layer where it says, hey, this recipe expects this layer to be present and you don't have that in your BB layers. You have to fix that problem in order for the recipe to actually build. At that point, this is really important when you, especially when you get to developer layers where your expectation is certain libraries will be provided by one group and the and the application will be provided by a different group. And if that layer isn't present in the build, it won't work correctly. And so that application developer will not have the appropriate pieces and it won't work. I've seen that before. There is a web, there is a website here, this layers.openembedded.org that shows all of the layers that we currently know about and who's responsible for them. And the who's responsible for them is so that you can go get the latest version. You can go make sure that you have, uh, if you have any questions about a particular layer or a recipe in that layer that you contact the appropriate people. So the Yocto project handles certain ones, but others are handled by different vendors for whatever reason. I'll use the example of Xilinx. So Meta Xilinx is supported by the Xilinx folks. And so you'd have to talk to them about it. Oftentimes they'll have their own mailing list. Sometimes they might have their own IRC channel, depends on, on who they are and what's going on with that. Any questions on that? Okay. All right. Add your layer to the comp. You'll notice that there is the continuation symbol here. Add layer, right? This continuation symbol, we're going to add it to the layer. That puts it, like I said, at the bottom of the list, if you will. Now, up till this point, we've been talking about building entire images. If we're going to build our example image, if you will, our example a recipe, there's going to be more than just that recipe because we've got to at least build the libraries. We've got to at least build the utilities that are required. We've got to build the tool chain and all those things have to be built ahead of time before you can build the actual recipe. So generally speaking, the recipe will have will be the last thing that's actually going to be built. If you're using an image recipe, for example, it'll build all of the dependencies and our dependencies ahead of time before it builds the very, very last things that are generally speaking that are required for everything else. So for example, if you're gonna run OpenSSH server, it's gonna have to build OpenSSL, it's gonna have to build that library, it's gonna have to build Zlib, it's gonna have to build a whole bunch of other things before it'll build OpenSSL for you, for example. The same with this example BB, it may be that it only requires libc, if it only requires libc, it'll build all the things that it needs, including libc, and then go ahead and build your particular recipe. All right. All right. So let's talk about images here. We're going to talk about the concept of images and, and how they actually help you out. One of the biggest problems is that we find in, especially in embedded space, is trying to figure out what do I need in my image to make this particular application in embedded space run. Typically, you'll see that there are hundreds and hundreds of libraries in a desktop, some of which you'll never use. You know, there's gigabytes of space used just for things that may, may be used in the future. In embedded space, we typically have a limited amount of space. We may have, you know, when I first started, we had 128 megabytes. That's all I had. 
and I had to fit the kernel, the bootloader, my application and everything else. So that wasn't a whole lot of space. The result of that was I had to really trim down on things. Well, with images here, we can create images that only have the libraries that we care about and only have the utilities that we care about in them and not have a bunch of extra stuff because we don't have the space typically in embedded space to do that, the embedded stuff. All right, so we're gonna build an entire Linux distribution from source. Yeah, that's the important thing. So people say, oh, BitBake is slow. Well, yeah, you're building an entire operating system from scratch, including the tool chain. You have to build the compiler, the tools, the libraries, all the BSP stuff, the kernel and the bootloader. I mean, how long does it take to sometimes build your own kernel? It may take an hour, depending on the machine that you're building on. Well, think about it now. You're also not only building um, a, a kernel, but you're also building it cross, which takes a little more time as well. In order to make sure that you don't have host pollution, you want to make sure that all of these services, applications, libraries, tool compiler, all those things have to be created from scratch and be separated from what's going on within the host system that you're, you're actually building on. You want to make sure that you have all these things completely separate so that you don't end up with linking your ARM binary to the x86 that's on your machine, because that would be fatal, right? For two reasons. One, it's not going to work. And number two, it's not going to end up on your image. It's not going to end up on that flash device. That x86 library that's on your build machine isn't going to show up over there. So it's not going to work. So we have to make sure that all of that gets done. And that's what this image file is going to do. This image recipe is going to do is gather all the appropriate base OS services, applications, libraries, bootloader, kernel, all of that for you and put it in a place that can be used to flash that image onto whatever flash memory that your device that you're normally using. So, all right. <clears throat> you sometimes need to create your own image recipe. Generally speaking, what you do is you start with one of the base OSs, you know, that are available to you like core image minimal or core image auto or whatever it is that's kind of the image that's closest to what you want. And then you start adding your own things. You added your own package groups, you add your own packages to make it yours, to make it your image. It's gonna include, I have to include my application. I have to include the libraries that I need for my application. And I need to include all this base set of things that I get from core image minimal or core image auto or something else plus whatever recipes that I need that are to enhance the base image file to get it. Okay, I need um, OpenSSH, I need um, Wayland Weston, I need all the different things like that. You add all those layers, you add all those recipes together, that forms your base image, and then you add on top of that your particular thing, your, your particular application and your particular libraries. And then you create a recipe, an image recipe that has all those pieces in it. And that becomes what you're going to create that you're going to use on your particular target device. You can add packages using the image install variable. You can add to it. Remember to use plus equals because you don't want to replace what's happening. You just want to append and add to things to it. So do not use the immediate version of that. Use plus equals. That's important. To create an images directory, in this case, you'll see that your meta YPD here, you're going to create a recipes core. We've seen recipes core, and then we're going to create specifically image recipes. We're going to put those in their own subdirectory. We're going to add this YPDD image BB file. We're going to give it a description here. We're going to go ahead and include package group <coughs> core boot. So we're going to create a core boot image. We're going to then also add P splash and drop bear P splash so it doesn't show a whole bunch of things scrolling across and drop bear so that we have something to use SSH for SSH. We're going to inherit core image. We're going to use the core image class, BB class, which will say, okay, I know that I'm going to look for things that are in core, core this using this package group plus this is going to give me a core image because I'm going to use that particular BB class that'll create this image for you. 
you're going to say the root file system size is 8192. That's in megabytes. So that's an eight gigabyte image that'll fit on an eight gigabyte flash. Okay. You're going to enable meta YPDD layer in your build. You're going to add it to comp layer.conf. That's at the top. Again, you're going to make sure that the path to meta YPDD is in that BB layers variable declaration. You'll see what that looks like. There it is right there. Meta. So we're going to go ahead and get the OE core. We're going to get meta Pocky. So we have um, a distribution policy layer that'll tell us what we want to do that will also include meta Yocto BSP since we're going to probably build for QEMU of something. Since meta Yocto BSP does that for you, that's fine. Makes it easier. And then we're going to add our own layer, meta YPDD on top of that. And then any modifications we do will show up through the other layers. We've already done that, of course, when we did the bitbake layers add layer. Then you're going to go ahead and bitbake your own custom image. You have your YPDD image. And of course, your YPDD image is going to be this package group pieces plus these plus anything else. And we haven't added any additional things. You'll notice that we just added these two packages above this core boot. We need PSplash and we need drop bear. So we have now have an SSH server and we now have a way of throwing up something that says Yocto while the thing is booting instead of a whole bunch of things scrolling across the screen. As far as that goes. So now we're going to go ahead and bit bake it. If your solid state, if your shared state dir is configured correctly, it should take yes, less than five minutes. And the reason why is because we've already done something that we built bit baked a core image minimal. So this package group has already been built. Let's see, this package group here, core boot has already been built for you. The only thing that you're gonna build is your P-Splash and your drop bear because they're not part of the original, part of this core image boot and the core, core image minimal. And so it's gonna sit there, parse it and say, what's been built? what's been built for this particular architecture. Hey, we've got all these things done. The only thing we haven't built is P-Splash and Drop Bear. Okay, we haven't built Drop Bear. And since we haven't done that, we need to build Zlib and OpenSSL Live Lib. So all of those things would have to be done to satisfy the dependencies of Drop Bear. So it's only gonna build like five or six things. Easy peasy goes fast. Of course, remember that you've already done a whole bunch of the other stuff ahead of time. And as long as you haven't changed the the local.com to switch from QMU ARM to QMU x86, it takes only those five minutes to do because it doesn't have to rebuild the entire tool chain. All right. So once you're done, once you're done with that, you have to check to see whether SSH server and you're going to say which drop bear is here. If you use the graphical invocation of QMU using VNC viewer, you'll see the splash screen on the boot. You don't have to, but you can see that. So there are any questions about this now before I move on? Okay. All right. All righty here. So now we're going to go ahead and build and boot your custom image. We're going to check the witch drop bear here. We're going to go ahead and use the graphical invocation so you can see it. You don't have to, however. So if you going back here just a little bit because I've got a little bit of time here. One thing to note is, is that when you're going to extend your image, you want to sit there and normally you would extend it by adding additional things to the image. There's three or four variables you can use. You can use OE image extend. There's a three or four. So you might not see it be done just the same way. But in your recipe, in your image recipe, you can say, I want to add these particular things. So for example, it's really, um, let's take a look here at this. This package install here, we could use core, core boot and we could 
add three or four package groups. Package groups are groups of packages that have been glumped together. Of course, they have their own dependencies, so you want to build that. So if, if the thing that you're looking for is in a particular package group, it might be better to use that because it'll bring in a whole bunch of other dependencies for you. P splash here, and these are specific things that you want. Um, did, did he talk about conflicts? Did he have a chance to talk about conflicts? Anyone? Okay, conflicts. An important thing to note is that there are some applications and some services that are, are conflict with each other. For example, a really well-known one in embedded space is DropBear, which is an SSH server and open SSH server. So if you take a look at the recipes for each one of those, you'll find that it says uh, open SSH server says I conflict with DropBear. So you can only have one or the other and the parser will go along and say, hey, you've got both open SSH server and DropBear in here, that's a problem. Our conflicts. So let's talk about conflicts here. In this particular case, DropBear and an open SSH server have a direct conflict with each other because they're both going to try and grab a hold of port 22 when they're running. So therefore, that's not going to work. So this is one that I know that a lot of people hit in embedded space. So you have to decide whether you want to use the DropBear itself um, and make sure that, that you um, use it. One thing to note is that DropBear and OpenSSH uh, won't allow you to boot correctly and won't come up unless you have a Etsy password file. So one of the things that you'll have to do is there's a, and we, have, we don't really talk about it here, there is a, there is a reference to it in the manual, however, that you're going to have to have at least the root file system, at least the root um, password set in order to be able to actually log in using DropBear or for that matter using OpenSSH. You're going to have to get that set up initially. And there's a recipe that handles that as well, specifically. We're not going to get into that here. I don't have a slide for it. So there's that. Let's see, what else is there? Oh, um, did he talk about, um, did he also talk about libraries that conflict with each other, like lib international and lib get text and things like that. So you'll run into that as well, since those are going to be common libraries you're going to use. You'll find that a lot of libraries um, conflict with each other that you're trying to use. They, they do the same thing a different way. So you'll see that a lot in image files as well. Hey, I want to do this. It'll try and include both lib international as well as 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 lib um, as lib get text and one of them will it'll say hey i've got a conflict here the other thing that happens especially in image files is you'll see that certain libraries are architectural specific you'll see a lot of that so you might end up having to deal with that as well when you create an image and the image is missing certain pieces you might have to add them for your particular architecture to make it work right as well Now, this image root size here is a is is the size of the actual root file system. So if it goes above that, it'll say, "Hey, it'll complain and say, I, I, I can't make an image greater than that because you told me not to." Now, at this point, the image may or may not be ext4. It may be just simply part of your file system, and indeed, most of the time, it is. There's an additional step we call WIC, which actually creates the actual image and puts that on a physical device. What you've created here is the boot. Um, you've created the bootloader in a directory. You've created the, the kernel in its own directory. And you've created the root file system image for the architecture that you've specified in local.conf or wherever else it was dealing with it. Yes, you in fact tell it, conf there's a variable conflicts equals, and then you tell it what, what it is, or it are conflicts. You can have both of them there, but you can't have both of them running. 
if you will. Right. So, so for example, you might tell it that you've got a particular version. Oh, this, this is, this is really a bit difficult. It's, it's very much like developing on when you're developing on x86 or whatever you're, you know, for whatever you're dealing with. If you have to have a different version of the library to make something work, you're going to have to resolve that conflict because you don't, you can't have both of them running, right? So what you're going to have to do is you're either going to have to specify a particular version running and not link it to the to the base SO and have your own version of it, or you're going to have to upgrade whatever it is and hope that the rest of the system will work. This is one of the reasons why we you want to you may want to update uh, your version of Yocto, for example. Dunfell may be too old for it. You may need to go to a later version of it because it supports a later library that your particular application needs, or you have something related to dealing with, for example, you have to um, have a later version of Wayland Weston in order to make it work the way you want to. That's not unusual for that. Or the OSV vendor that you have um, has got a new version and you go to that OSV, but you realize it's updated everything else out from underneath you and your 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 library, so rather your um, your layer now has to be updated to be compatible with the OSV's new version of things. That's not unusual as well. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, uh, that particular question. Is there any way to find out what the final image packaging? You want to know what's in it? Is, is that what you're asking? You can do a dry run uh, using open embedded or using BitBake's dry run feature and you can, it'll tell you what's going to be in it. So you can see what's going to actually be built. There are a list of packages. Yes, you can you can look at that. Um, what you have to do is you have to do one of two things. Either you do a dry run, or the second way to do that is to go and look at each package group that it's going to use. So, for example, we're using poor package group core boot. Well, package group core boot comes out of um, it, it happens to come out of the meta layer. I just know that that package group core boot. So you can go look at that recipe and you can see everything that's in that recipe. You can see everything that it's going to that it's going to add from that recipe. You can look at that recipe, and it'll tell you exactly what it's going to do. So, if you have multiple, you know, package group core boot, package group core, you know, whatever it is, package group console, whatever it is, those con you can look at all of those individual package group recipes, and from the package group recipe, you can go ahead and determine what's going to actually be built from it. Did that answer the question? You're welcome. Okay. All right. Okay. We have an we have a graphical interface called Toaster. It runs. Um, it's built upon Python, as pretty much everything else is. That uses Django. It allows you. Um, it sets up a BitBake builder server, which it then becomes the front end for. It allows you to schedule and 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 manage um, building images in a way that is graphical. It allows you to add things to the recipes, add change what kind of image, change what architecture you want to use, all kinds of stuff. What it doesn't allow you to do is stop it after you've sent it off to be built. So that's kind of the annoying feature of it, if you will. But it also will tell you what happened and, you know, it happened. Here's a failed task down here. You're showing that. You have 10 warnings, four warnings. Warnings are okay. Errors are not, right? Warnings are, yeah, something happened. It wasn't happy with that, but it still continued. Errors, it didn't, it didn't finish. Remember, we use bitbake minus K 
the minus k says build as much as you possibly can. And the reason why we do that is because you'd hate to have it sit there and on the first thing that it tries to fetch, blow up and stop. And so it never built anything for you the next morning when you came back and you're starting over from ground zero. So just build everything that you can and then tell me what the errors are. In this particular case, we see that ACL, the do configure, uh, the do configure step blew up and didn't work. But everything else did. So everything else, you'll notice that this is a core image X11, which meant it built a whole lot of stuff, built a whole bunch of X11 pieces, built a whole bunch of other things. So just the fact that it couldn't use this access control library piece, while it's annoying, um, it built everything else for you. You'll notice in this particular case, in this core image Sato, it says I built an ext 3 an HDD image, an ISO, and a TAR BZ2. These are the different images that I had it because I had some image options where I told it to, to create these other images for me. And you may have gotten warnings on those. You can look at what the four, what the warnings are by clicking this as well. So that's kind of nice. You can see it tells you how long it took to do the build and ETA, ETAs are just that. They don't, I mean, this may, this may dramatically uh, increase. Because BitBake has a lot of parallelization, it sits there and it may sit there and be having, you know, five or 10 things running at the same time. And then all of a sudden you'll see that there's only one thing running because everything else is a dependency on that particular task to get done. And then it'll go back again and start doing five or 10 or 11 things. But if it's waiting on a particular thing, it'll, it, it may go down to only one thing and wait there for 10 or 15 minutes. This is especially true if you're building QT5 things and all of a sudden it's got to do the big link at the end of it for, for like QT web engine and stuff like that. Builds everything and then it goes down and it's doing that link and you're just waiting for the link to happen. So that's not unusual. You can see that this shows recent builds and all builds um, in this particular case. To build toaster, you download the you get the Pocky repo. It comes as part of a particular version of Pocky. You can go ahead and you can get checkout as required by Toaster. It basically says do not use the release tarball. And that's because they're always fixing Toaster as well. You're going to have to go ahead and do a bunch of Python-y things here using virtual environment. You can use PIP3 to install all the requirements and make sure it has all the Django pieces and all the other library pieces that are necessary. Luckily, this toaster requirements.txt in the bitbake directory of Pocky um, does, a, does all that work for you. You're going to go ahead and create your own toaster project directory. And you'll notice that source toaster start and wait two minutes. And they mean it because remember that Python being an interpreted language means that it takes a little while to set everything up, especially the first time. And then you can, of course, talk to it using a web browser at a port 8000 and it'll go ahead and, and you'll be able to see something that looks like this. In fact, it looks like this <coughs> here. You can go ahead and read the manual. You can play with your toaster project, create something and you can see this is what it'll look like. You can go ahead and add a new project here using this. You can decide which release you're going to use all the way up to the version of of, Pi, of Pocky that you're using. You tell it what machine you want to deal with and what image you want to build. Go ahead and run it and off you go. Okay, I don't have it running here on this particular machine right now. I had to take it off because I ran out of space. And so uh, you can go ahead and play with this at your leisure. This is something you can actually create because it comes with every version of Pocky. Are there any questions on this? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you, you have to use the Git checkout. Um, you'll notice that the Git clone, in this case, the branch that we're using is Dunfell. We want to get it, even though it comes as part of this 
you want to actually go get a version of it and not use the release tarball version because they fix a lot of things in between. So use this git clone right here. And you have to tell it what branch you want to use. So you want to use toaster for the branch that you're using. So if you're using something else, you're using um, Honus, uh, Honister or using Gates Garth, never can say that right, Gates Garth, you want to make sure that you actually use the correct branch for, for uh, whatever you're actually using already. You go ahead and get the correct version of that because then it, it actually works with the correct uh, um, version of BitBake. And again, all the libraries and everything else works as well. Now, Toaster itself <clears throat> creates its own, as you saw here, you have this directory that you've created. Let's see, where is it? Yeah, you've created your own directory here, right? Make their home toaster and there's your toaster here. When you start it up, you're going to notice that you're going to do a Pocky OENet build environment and create a, your own toaster project directory. That toaster project directory is where toaster will expect to run all of its builds. Now, you've already told it, it actually does know about where um, Meta is and where Meta Pocky and all the other pieces are as well. It knows to look in your bblayers.com to make sure that it's got the correct layers that's going to build from. Did that answer the question about the Git checkout note? Okay, so there's your toaster. Now, if you want to go ahead and add your own application, we're going to create our own Hello World application and add it to our custom image. Now, we created an image that used essentially what was core image minimal. We added a P splash and we went ahead and added our, our SSH uh, server to it. We're going to now add our own Hello World application. The general procedure is to write it, create a recipe that's a simple C directory, for example, with a simple C one is a great place to start. Modify the image recipe to add that. Remember, we showed how we added those things. We added it using this. Pretty typical is to add, let's see, it's right here. Image install plus that, right? So we're going to add our hello world, your hello or whatever we decide to call it, the recipe. So that it can find hello.bb. Okay. So we also have to, if you're going to build something that comes from the recipe that comes from an upstream sources, you have to add the source URI. You'll have to add the license information for it. You'll have to add the checksum information for it. All that stuff has to come from, from somewhere, and you've got to keep track of that. For simple C, you can just add the hello application source to the directory in the files directory, right? In the hello package directory. So here we have your you're in your meta YPDD, you have recipes core. We're going to make a hello directory for it. And then we're going to add files, and that's where your C source will be. You can go ahead and create your um, recipe here in hello.c. Here's what it looks like, pretty straightforward. That goes in the files. So then you're going to write your recipe here and you're going to point to the files directory for it to find it. And then you're going to go ahead and create that. All right. So here's our hello world example. We'll see that it's, you know, here's our file here for our MIT license. There's our working directory. Here's our source URI. There really isn't one. There's a compile and an install, and it shows the directory. And this is actually, I believe, this might actually be a case of where um, this slide is not showing correctly. So I might need to change something here. Hold on. I'm going to do something here and turn this off. See if it's. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Sorry about that. There's an example of how it didn't actually work correctly. Okay, let me go ahead and present again. All right, so now in this particular case, you can see that the license is MIT. 
Um, there's your there's your uh, MIT checksum. The source URI is the file that's in hello.c and it'll look in the files directory. Here's our flags that we're going to pass into the compiler. We have a do install, which is going to have some additional pieces where we create our own. We're going to install it in this directory. We have a bin directory for it and the bin directory hello. So it's going to be dropped into there with 755. Now this this make der, this is like having a make der minus um, P. You'll notice that it gives the mode. So if the directory isn't present, this 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 D directory um, binder isn't there, it'll create it and give it the permissions of 755 and it's going to do the same thing with the install piece. It's going to drop it into that binder as as hello. All right. Go ahead and modify your image recipe. I showed you how to do that. It'd be in the image install section where you add it to that space delimited between the two of them. Then go ahead and build your image. So here's kind of what it would look like here. You'll notice that it adds it right here, space delimited between those two and the image install section. Any questions on any of that? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good answer. KVM actually, yeah, KVM and, and QMU are the same project, essentially, same people. And so they go hand in hand, pretty much. Okay. All right. Now you're going to bit make a rebuild in this case. You're going to bit make your YPDD image, right? And don't forget that we've added the new hello. So now hello one BB will be processed because it's already there. When you boot your image and run QEMU, you can go ahead and see, you can type hello and get the command line and you will see hello world. That's how you know that it actually made it in there. There's other ways to know as well that it made it into your image. You can look at some of the logs. You can look at the output of BitPay. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can look at. But yes, in, and you can actually look at the uh, root file system, generally speaking, on your uh, existing host machine there. So any questions on any of this? How much time do I have left, Ian? I'm trying to find the calendar here. Oh, hour and 30 minutes. That's longer than I thought. Okay, well, that's good. That's good then, all right. All right. So here's the thing to note, Linux is not an embedded distribution and it really creates one for you. Mm -hmm. I've got some more slides here I'm gonna show. So it creates a custom one for you. Remember that we're gonna configure this. We're gonna add all the recipes that we want. We're gonna add all the additional pa um, package groups that we need. And we're gonna go ahead and create this unified image. And the unified image will often contain the kernel as well as the bootloader pieces as well. We have another piece that we haven't talked about, which is called WIC. It uses the Kickstarter protocol. The Kickstarter protocol allows it to define what thing we're going to get from what place and put into what partition in, in, in a, uh, for example, an SSD or on a, a compact flash device or on, a, or on an SD card. So we create an image that has all of the appropriate things in all the appropriate places. Um, we can also have it to where that it um, puts the bootloader pieces that are necessary to be at the beginning of that particular piece, for example, so that um, the onboard bootloader of the device can point to the correct vector um, and jump into the secondary bootloader U boot typically or something else code. And so we actually know where to put that 
and in the image file such that that can be put on an actual device and have the bootloader, the, the primary bootloader, call the secondary bootloader appropriately. And then the, that bootloader contains also the information for booting up the kernel and whatever uh, root file system and where that's going to be located. 